I invite you to open your hearts as the choir calls us into worship.
Lord of the universe, thank you for the light of this morning. Lord of the church, thank you for this holy community. Lord of the cosmos, we pray that you will be among us today, that you will work in us to accomplish your purposes, work through us in the week to come to create peace and beauty and harmony. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Today's offering is for the church budget. In Psalms 8, we're told that men and women were created a little bit lower than the angels and have been crowned with glory and honor. That is an incredible statement. And with it, though, it brings great responsibility. How are we doing to take care of the things that God has entrusted into our hands? How do the words glory and honor make you feel? Pretty special in God's eyes. Well, think about these things as you return your tithes and offerings today. Will the deacons please stand and prepare to receive the things we have to share? Lord, help us grow as caretakers of your trust. May we become people of honor who reflect your glory. Amen.
girls. Good morning. Oh, your voices sound so nice on my ears. Thank you for that lovely good morning. I wanted to ask you a question. I want to know, what is your favorite scent? Your favorite smell? I know, I know that some of you feel really happy when you smell. Um, I like the smell of mangoes. Man, mangoes are so good. Green apple. Green apple is such a good smell. Smell of like candy and fruit. <laughs> yes, candy and fruit. And I'm sure that some of you absolutely love the smell of cookies baking. Am I the only one? Oh man, it's so good. It's so good. You know, you know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians that our lives are like a Christ-like fragrance to God. Do you know what a fragrance is? Fragrance is a, oh yes, please. Smell. A smell. It's a smell, that's right. Um, and and what, that really, what that really means is when we're among our friends and we're being nice and sweet, like I know all of you are, God gets happy because it's like we're giving off a scent, like we're giving off a scent of a mango, you know, really nice sweet smell. It's like we're giving off the smell, the, the scent of an apple, and God is really, really happy when he sees us doing the right thing because our lives are just like that nice scent, that, that nice smell that we like to smell. So the lesson for this, this morning is to be nice and be sweet and be loving because just like your favorite fruit or candy, our lives give off a nice fragrance to God when we're good and when we do the right thing and when we love each other. Okay, so let's grab our baskets so that we can... Yeah.
Father in heaven, we thank you for the lovely morning, for all the things you've created, the birds, the flowers, the new leaves on the trees, all a reminder of your glorious creation. They point us back to you. We thank you especially for the Sabbath day, a time of place, and a place to worship with you every week. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning as a people desiring to be closer to you. We ask that you revive us. We think of those times when your spirit moved in the past, when you've spoken through your word and you moved upon hearts, and there's been a revival, a stirring in the hearts of your people, and today we pray for that same thing that will be accomplished again right here and now in us. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. It's a marvelous thing that would take an eternity to comprehend. You left your high position in the heavens perfect harmony, humbling yourself just so that we could have an opportunity to know you and be in heaven with you. Our only hope and desire is to be more like you. Fill us with your thoughts so that we can think as you do. We submit our will to you today. Mold us and shape us. We want to be individuals that honor you in all we do. We want to stand firm on the side of truth and not waver when times are tough and obstacles confront us. We confess our need for yet additional grace from your throne, asking for a greater blessing from on high. We come not because there's anything good in us, anything that we've done, not because we deserve it or are worthy. We come simply because Jesus has invited us to come boldly to the throne. We come because of his righteousness, because Jesus lived and he died and he now intercedes for us. We ask that you give the gift that you are waiting to bestow upon us as we open up your word with the pastor's preaching today. We claim that promise. May we all seek your presence and glory in it today as we worship you. Amen. Testament scripture lesson today is from Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 7. Look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. God the Lord created the heavens and stretched them out. He created the earth and everything in it. He gives breath to everyone, life to everyone who walks the earth. And it is he who says, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them. And you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons.
The New Testament reading today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. One day, Jesus called together his twelve disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Take nothing for your journey, he instructed them. Don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, food, money, or even a chain of clothes. Wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. And if a town refuses to welcome you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So they began their circuit of the villages, preaching the good news and healing the sick. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. Sometimes, just as a miracle, God gives you proof that as an old person, you're still really with it. (laughs) This morning, Julian the sound guy asked me what phone I had gotten because he was thinking about getting a phone. Now, if a young person asked somebody of my advanced age, about a piece of technology. I'm with it. I mean, that is just so cool. Unfortunately, there's a backstory. The reason Julian was asking me about what phone I had gotten is because he knew that I had gotten a phone. The reason he knew that I had gotten a phone is that I had told the story of my acquisition of this phone on Facebook. And the reason there was a story to tell is that I had gone to the store and bought a perfectly good phone. And my kids found out about the phone I had purchased and threatened to disown me if I did not return the phone and get a better one. Being an obedient father, I went back to the store and said, my son said, I can't have this. I want a different one. (laughs) I think the salesman had heard that before. He didn't bat an eye. Oh, all right. What did he tell you to get? (laughs) Now, you kids, you may not understand this, but people my age, we understand that when it comes to technology, no matter how smart and wise and sage we know ourselves to be, we ask the kids. And if your kids love you, and if they're smart, you will end up in a far better place than if you used all of the strength of your intelligence to try to make your own decision. It saves you a trip to the store. One of the most dramatic statements in the Old Testament, in the the stories of the kings, is when David is about to die and he has appointed his son Solomon to be his successor And David's friends come in and they say to him, may his kingdom be greater than yours. It is the only context in which you could ever say to a king, may somebody else be greater than you. I mean, those are words that would cause you to lose your head in almost any other conceivable context. But when you're an old king and you have an heir that you admire, the greatest wish that 
someone could give the old king is, and may your heir exceed you. I hope we can kind of hold that in the back of our head as we move through our examination of of today's scripture passage. The New Testament passage that Doug read for us, Luke chapter nine. Embedded in that, uh, let's see, was it in that passage? I'm not sure. In Luke chapter nine, (laughs) in in the mission of the 12, there's a, a, a few sentences inserted. You find the same sentences in Matthew and in Mark in slightly different contexts. This is apparently a story that was important in the early church. We don't know how they got this story, but it was important, and it shows up in different places. The story goes like this. Old King Herod was sitting in his palace, and he was troubled. He was perplexed. He was hearing stories about this amazing preacher that was drawing crowds. Thousands and thousands of people were coming to hear this preacher. And Herod is thinking, wait a minute. I know about famous preachers. I just beheaded one not very long ago, like a month or two or three ago. It wasn't that long. I got rid of the famous preacher The reports I'm hearing sound a lot like that guy, but he's gone. What's up? And so his advisors begin trying to explain because they've been hearing the reports too. And they're going, well, um, some people think it's John the Baptist resurrected. Maybe you better go check and see where that head is that you cut off. Maybe... Maybe the head and the body have been put back together and God brought him back to life. That's what some people say. Eh, that didn't seem too likely. Somebody else said, there are a lot of people who are thinking this is the ancient prophet Elijah resurrected as a harbinger of the final age of the earth. The last days are upon us. Because in Jewish tradition, that was... Elijah was going to reappear, and this is the beginning of the end. Others said, well, maybe it's, maybe it's one of those other prophets, one of those other famous guys, you know, hundreds of years ago that has come back bringing a message from God. In this particular little snippet, this little picture of Herod's court, it ends with... Herod just kind of bewildered. It says he really wanted to see him, which would have been a little tricky. Because part of the reason Herod was suddenly getting all of these reports was that John the Baptist had not just been resurrected. John the Baptist had been resurrected and cloned. Jesus had been preaching and his ministry exploded after John the Baptist. So the confusion between Jesus and John the Baptist for Herod made sense. Their, their, their ideas coincided and the timing, it, it made sense that that was confusing. But, but what had gotten Herod's attention, the way Luke puts it, is this sudden explosion Because the way the reports were coming in, they would get reports from some town three days' journey south. And 10 minutes later, somebody would walk in with a report from a village three days' journey north describing the same preacher. Now remember, in in those days, there were no pictures, there were no iPhones. There was some guy three days' journey south that was healing people, working incredible miracles, maybe even raising the dead, casting demons out of people, and some guy three days north doing exactly the same thing, and some guy three days east, and some guy three days west. It was like 
John the Baptist had been resurrected and, and multiplied. How did this happen? Well, Luke chapter 9, the beginning of the chapter, describes what happened. Jesus had done this amazing healing ministry. If you read what had been going on just before, Jesus and his disciples had gotten in a boat and were traveling, traveling across the Sea of Galilee. A storm exploded onto the lake. The waves were so big, the boat was going to sink, or at least uh, swamp. The disciples thought they were going to die. And they look back and they see Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. So they go and wake him up. <laughs> Don't you realize we're going to die? Don't you care? And Jesus gets up, raises his hand and says, hey, winds, stop. Waves, relax. And the wind grew still and the waves became calm. And the disciples are going, whoa. You'd have gone, whoa, too. This is, this is incredible. A few hours later, they finally get across the lake, and they're met with somebody who comes charging out of an area of tombs, the man is, is a raging demoniac. He's spouting all kinds of stuff. Jesus orders the evil, the demon in the man to leave. And the man goes from this raging, threatening person to someone civil and receptive. What kind of power is this? They get back to Capernaum. No sooner do they arrive in town, somebody comes and says, Jesus, please come heal my daughter. And on the way to go heal that daughter, he meets a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. Jesus heals her. She has spent all her money, she spent all her money chasing every cure in the universe. It doesn't exist. And Jesus, with a mere touch, she's healed. By the time he gets to the home of the other daughter who was sick, she's dead, no problem. Jesus raises her back to life. No one in the history of the world like this. Jesus is one of a kind. That's the end of chapter eight. The beginning of chapter nine, Jesus calls his 12 assistants and said, you've been watching what I've been doing. You go do it. So instead of one person in one place, you now have 12 people. Matthew says they went out two by two. Okay, six groups, either way. You've got an explosion of this divine activity, this healing, helping, making whole, an explosion. And all of a sudden, Jesus is not one of a kind. Jesus is the leader of a pack, the father of a tribe. I, Jesus is being replicated across Palestine. No wonder Herod's getting reports. Wow, this has never happened before. It's a whole lot easier to be a miracle worker than it is to make miracle workers. At least that's my impression. Some of you who are really, really, really good cooks, is it easier to make a fantastic meal or to teach somebody else how to do what you do? <laughs> the sound of a growing church. <laughs> Take any skill that you have. Yeah, this, this congregation is full of people with incredible skills. Which is easier, to do what you do or to teach somebody else how to do it? 
Those of you who teach music, <laughs> you know, can you call it out of someone else? Luke 9 begins with Jesus saying, look, you guys that have been hanging with me, you go do it. And they go and they do it. And then I love the end of this little section. It says they go out, they do it. And then they come back. And Jesus says, come, let's go. And, and they try to go and find a little quiet place. And can you imagine them sitting around the table and telling their stories? You know, Peter, you won't believe what I did. You won't believe what happened. And even the quiet ones, the ones that we don't know much about, they would just, can you imagine how excited these guys would have been? Wouldn't it have been cool to be there and listen to them tell their stories? Yeah. It's common for religious people to fall into arguments about just what is the nature of our identity. I remember when I was in seminary, oh man, we, we loved to duke it out theologically. You know, and if you'd read a few theologians and you could use some really long Latinate words, you know, you talk about soteriology and ecclesiology, epidemiology, no, we didn't talk about that at seminary. <laughs> Yeah, but you stick ology on the end of it there and it sounds really impressive. And you know, justification and sanctification and glorification and Latinification and and I don't mean to trivialize our efforts as humans to create rational structures to explain what we know of God and the universe. But if we used Luke 9 as the central vision of what it means to be Christian, we would see that for Jesus to be a devotee, to be a follower, to be a disciple means to go do what Jesus did. Now, some of you who are smart will point out the fact that most of us are not capable of raising the dead. We cannot, with a word, heal the human maladies that we see around us. And some of us are haunted by that. You know, I don't know what kind of human hurt you come up against. But we all come up against it. And we wish we had more power. We wish we could fix it. And I'll leave to others the nice arguments about how we explain some of that. I want us to pull us back to this place, though. Jesus gave the disciples some stuff, some power. And he told them, go use it. And at minimum, all of us have some power. And my belief is that central to what it means to be a Christian is the call to go use it. In Jesus' world, the greatest challenge might have been the immediate physical maladies, you know, pain and suffering. And with a word, he could fix it. There are places in the world where still, you know, Band-Aids are precious things. You remember when we had a, a Quaker doctor here who had worked at the Adventist Hospital in, was it Botswana? And she was, you know, had us participate in a fundraising program to buy IV kits or something, you know, just basic stuff. You know, the, 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 the stuff that we couldn't even imagine not having a surplus of, and there they didn't have any of it. So there are places where that's the great need. But in our world, most of the time, that's not the greatest need. 
And often the greatest needs are things that we can fill. Someone to be with us. Someone to hear us. What do you have? What can you do? Some of you are rich. Actually, (laughs) most of us are rich. So we can do something with our money. We can take a few dollars. I get the biggest kick out of it. Every time I go to Aurora Commons, it seems like there's a crisis that can be solved with $5. I mean, it is so cool. The last time I'm there, they ran out of dish soap. I'm going, I can do it. I can do it. You're going, you can? Yeah, I've got a car. I know where the store is. And I came back with a bottle of dish soap. I'm a hero for the day. (laughs) You need us to reimburse you? I said, no, Green Lake will. So you bought dish soap. (laughs) Yeah, but it was easy. I mean, the reality is, compared to most of the people in the world, most of us are rich, we can do something with our money. And we are called to do it. Some of us have brilliant intellects. And God calls us to use that brain power to help and not to hurt, to heal and not to harm. Some of us have social connections. Some of us can sing. Thank you. You lift our hearts. Some of us can play instruments. And you lift our hearts because not all of us can do that. The essence of being a disciple of Jesus in Luke 9 is you take what you've got and you give it. Let me push it a little farther. The essence of being a Christian is not being really clear about what you're against. You know how easy easy it is to say what you're against? I'm against all kinds of stuff. (laughs) And so are you. And it'd be real easy to list, you know, create a list of things we don't like, things we hate, things that disgust us and annoy us. So, that's not what we're called to as Christians. We're called to take what we have and use it to do good. This week, here in Seattle, of all places, I'm so glad it happened here. You guys know who Dan Rice is? Price, not Rice, Price. Yeah, somebody in the choir knows. Any of you know who Dan Price is? Are Rona and I the only two people here who know that? Oh, you've got to Google this quietly so nobody sees you. This week, Dan Price made New York Times Magazine, I mean New York Times newspaper, um, he had read some stuff about what it takes to make people happy. Can you make people happy with money? Yep, you can. On Tuesday, I did it with $5 when I bought some soap. I made some people real happy with $5. You can make people happy with $5. There's a lot of research that shows that for poor people, adding some money to their life does, in fact, increase their happiness. For most of us here, money, more money will not make us more happy because we already have the, amount of, the minimum amount of money it's required for basic human happiness. But there's a lot of research that says if you live in Seattle and your household income is less than 70000 more money makes you happier. Dan Price has a small business. He's doing well. He read that and he said, I've got employees who are not happy. They're not as happy as they could be. They're not as happy as I could make them if I raised their pay. And so he announced that over the next three years, he's going to raise the pay of the the lowest paid people in his company until everybody in his company has an annual income of $70,000. And of course, this created a firestorm of conversation. What would happen if more corporations did this? And then people said, well, it would be great if they did, but it won't happen. (laughs) But the reality is, 
something as material, as prosaic as money, if we could rearrange our society to bring the bottom up, we would increase human well-being. And Luke 9 shows Jesus commissioning his disciples to go out and make people better. Take what we've got and make the world better. When we do that with a clear vision of how Jesus would regard the people we're interacting with. Then we're walking the path of Christ. Then, appropriately, we would be called Christian. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.